呃，我是 A F I 的活动的组织人，很高兴呃，欢迎各位家长呢能参加今晚的我们的升学讲座。简短的介绍一下我们的 A F I 哈 ，A F I 的话呢，英文是 Alliance for Impact， 我们的原名呢是华人咖啡俱乐部。呃 ，A F I 呢是美国联邦和纽约州批准的5 0 1 C 3的非盈利的公益组织。我们的宗旨呢是宣传以华裔为主的亚裔群体对当地社会的贡献，并且增强我们亚裔群体呢对这个主流社会的影响力，整体的提升我们华裔。在内的这个亚裔群体的整体地位 ，A F I 呢，我们不仅是服务呃在美国的华人哈，呃，我们同时的话呢，也是呃包括包括进进了非常多的一个来自呃加拿大的华人，甚至呢是来自欧洲的、来自日本的华人。所以呢 ，A F I 的下一步的计划呢，我们也是希望能搭建一个能服务我们全球华人群体的这样的一个资源的互补和知识共享的平台，呃，并且呢是进一步的促进我们的华人。人群体的抱团取暖，携手共赢。思慧学院呢，是 A F I 在教育领域的非盈利合作伙伴。呃，思慧学院呢是致力于将最优质的财商、投资、沟通、领导力及职场的教育，以最浅显易懂以及最呃合适的价格带给我们的华人的家庭。呃，目前思慧学院旗下呢有包括多个系列的成人投资、职场及领导力的培训课程，以及 K 十二的华尔街少年财商投资系列课程，以及青少年的沟通以及创业及领导力等多个系列的课程。呃，在这个夏天的话呢，我也是预告一下哈，我们。呃，我们的思慧学院呢，会在纽约举行我们的首次的线下的夏令营。更多的详情的话呢，您可以登录网站 withwiseacademy.com， 或者呢是在我们的讲座的后半部分呢扫二维码加我们的小助手来了解详情。呃，大家目前看到的呢，是我们 A F I 从二零一七年十一月开始到目前，呃，在我们的这个社区哈形成的一些影响。呃，在过去四年的时间之内呢，我们呢是建立了一个超过五万人的在线社群，呃，并且呢是拥有了一百四十四十多个不同主题的微信群。我们每周呢都会针对我们华人目前最关心的热门话题进行多场的这个公益讲座哈。呃，话题呢包括我们最关心的呃教育，以及和华尔代的。这个亲子交流哈，以及我们的成人如何在职场上进一步的进行提升，并打破这个我们所谓的竹子天花板，还有我们华人关心的投资和房房地产等话题，并且在今年的话呢，我们也是新增了呃。专门为我们的家中有这个自闭症及 ADHD 的孩子的家长呢，呃，为他们建立的一个亲子学院。呃，这个亲子学院的话呢，我们会定期的举行呃炉边夜谈的这样的一个分享活动。此外的话呢，我们还有这一个呃云健身公益课程哈，每周有数十位呃不同领域的的我们的这个健身教练和导师哈，来给我们的群友提供各种不同的，包括瑜伽、舞蹈、武术、太极等等。各种课程，呃，此外的话呢，我们今年呢还新增了一个医疗健康的系列讲座，呃，我们会请到全美呃不同的这个领域的这个医生哈，来和我们分享一些一些关于这一个呃身体以及心理健康方面的话题。好的，现在预告一下下周的几个讲座。呃，下周周五呢是我们的 A F I 的影响力人物专访，我们再次请回了在去年被评为是我们 A F I 平台上最受欢迎的这个讲座嘉宾的莫天成莫老，让他呢带带给我们一场关于这个中美关系的。英文讲座，呃，莫天成呢，他是美国劳工部前副部长及财务总长，同时呢，他也获得了美国亚太裔联邦雇员理事会的终身成就奖。呃，莫老呢，他作为一个政治性的人物哈，是呃是在美国政坛哈是呃是一个华裔的一个标杆式的人物。呃，各位群友呢，如果你们对这个莫天成莫老的讲座以及中美关系的这个话题感兴趣的呢，欢迎你关注我们下周五的。呃，重磅讲座。此外的话呢，我们在下周六呢，还会邀请到我们的呃藤校藤妈哈。
呃，罗涛，呃，他会给我们带来一场关于这个华裔家长申请道路上的常见误区的升学讲座。此外呢，在周三的话呢，是我们思慧学院的 Info Session， 呃，我们呢会呃会介绍我们在这个春季的呃写作竞赛的一些详细的情况，以及我们的春令营和我们的这一个呃王牌课程哈，这个投资竞赛的一些辅导的详细情况。呃，对我们的春令营以及思慧课程感兴趣的家长的。欢迎你关注我们周三的讲座。好的，现在的话呢，我就把时间交给我们的 IV Campus 的 CEO 索菲亚什，让他来为我们介绍一下 IV Campus 以及我们今天的嘉宾。好的，索菲亚，嗯，谢谢谢谢，大家好哈，我是索菲亚，嗯、呃，很高兴为大家服务。首先呢，我也是一位妈妈，也经历过孩子成长过程当中所有的焦虑和困惑。常常呢不知道怎么做才是最有效的，既想呢保护孩子主动意识、独立思想，又特别想高效的引导孩子解决当下的一些困难和一些难题。特别是高中阶段啊，是一个很特殊的人生阶段。我所观察到的美国高校的申请，对高中生来说是一个个人成长特别考验的过程。我看到了很多孩子们在这个过程当中的蜕变。我们指南针 Ivy Campus 呢？就是想把过滤过的、口碑最好的前藤校招生官，以及独立的升学顾问和优质的辅导课程以及竞赛辅导等教育资源，提供给我们家长来了解，并且做出最优的选择，为我们孩子们的升学及个人成长啊保驾护航。后续呢，我们还会陆陆续续的推出个人的量身定做的背景提升项目。还希望通过联手 AFI 和思慧平台来提供一些志愿者和领导力的提升项目。OK， Alison， 我们可以放到 Will 的这个、这个、这个、这个 slide <咳>。那今天呢，我们很高兴作为 Ivy Campus 呢，来推出一个明星导师。呃，这个导师呢，我已经跟他合作了六到七年。呃，他还是非常非常有经验。首先呢，他是前杜克大学的资深招生官。同时，他还是普兴教育在国内普兴教育的哈集团的 Senior Vice President。他同时帮助啄木鸟和普兴的美本美本申请的团队搭建了一个非常好的一个班子。今天呢，他会跟我们分享的主题是 Navigating the College Planning Process with Purpose。我觉得今天晚上家长可能会比较感兴趣，他最后会花时间特别着重的有一两个学生的案例分析，一个是 Stanford 的，还有一个是。很顺的啊，这两个学校都是极其难申请的。他会为我们来分析这几这两个学生他们做对了什么 ，in order for them to get admitted in this first tier of 呃、uh, 这个 Ivy League school 哈。所以呃、uh, ，let me give the floor to Will now, and、uh, you can open your presentation now. Thank you, thank you, Will. Fantastic, great, great. Thank you. Let me see if we can go ahead and open the presentation here. Great, thank you so much, Allison, Sophia, for your wonderful introduction.、Uh, once again, folks, my name is Will Dixon. I am managing、uh, director and founder of Elite Path International Education Counseling.、Uh, this evening,、uh, I want to、uh, address a couple of issues that I think are going to be very important. One is I want to really take you through competitive college admissions, that process, but we're going to do so. In a fairly novel way, and that is that we're going to go through it by examining actual case studies of students that I've worked with. And recently, I have two students who were admitted to Stanford University, restrictive early action, and one student、uh, who was admitted to Princeton University. Now, one of the things that we're going to do as we as we move through this、uh, uh, this particular process is that. It's going to be important in order to for me to take you step by step through what these students have done to really navigate with confidence and purpose、uh, their way into these schools is for you to understand and make sure that we're on the same page in terms of what is the college admissions process and what are schools looking for. They're actually、uh, two really not the same, although we can confuse it in that way. The other thing that I must admit that I've been guilty of is I've talked in previous presentations. I think maybe you have seen them, in which we talk generally about 
uh, college admissions in this rather generic way. And I thought that it would be very important for you to really understand how students actually go through this process in a step-by-step -step way. And we're going to do this uh, in a way that's going to be um, certainly focused on what these students did to get into Stanford and to Princeton. But I want you to know, if your student has no interest whatsoever in going to any of these Ivy League schools, which are great schools, of course, but perhaps they're interested in an Emory University, uh, New York University, uh, Georgia Tech University, the things that I share with you are going to be very applicable for those schools as, as well, okay? So indulge me just for one moment because we're gonna get into this process, but I do want to just go over briefly a bit of my background. So for purposes of this presentation, my history begins at Duke University. And that's uh, where I spent a number of years uh, engaged in evaluating applications uh, with the, my fellow colleagues and team uh, in which I probably reviewed, I mean, multiple thousands of applications during this time of students who were really very talented, brilliant students from around the United States and international as, as well. But another important responsibility that I had while I was there was to provide continuing education to the staff uh, at Duke, as well as training new admissions officers on best practices. Something I'm also very proud of is that I spent a couple, well, two to three years focused exclusively on working with students who were already at Duke and really helping them to navigate the process for success up until the time that they um, chose their primary major. And that's important because I take a lot of that with me now when I work with students to help them so that they're not only going through this process of getting admitted into top universities or the university of their, of their choice, but also how to be successful once they get into the university. Later after Duke, I spent time, I lived in China, I lived in Beijing, I lived in Shenzhen, working with a company that asked me to join them. Actually, there were some former colleagues of mine as well from Duke University, but asking me to join them to help build a platform, an international platform for their students who are looking to come to school in the US. And during that time, I've managed 17 offices. I had about 400 counselors uh, that I trained and worked with very closely. We were very successful in that process. And we took that country, that company, excuse me, public in June of 2018 in New York on the New York Stock Exchange. So we're very excited, very proud of that, that good work. Now, really what I wanted to share with you though is sort of my personal background. My personal background is that I attended Duke University where I received my undergraduate degree in economics and I also received a law degree from Duke. I have two sons, one that graduated from Wake Forest University, another from Duke University. My wife's a UNC, University of North Carolina graduate. And I have a daughter who is currently uh, in high school. Why do I share that with you? I share it with you essentially because what we talk about, what I talk about with you today is not something that I've heard, uh, it's not something that I've read, but it's something that I've actually lived. I attended a top university. More importantly, I'm a parent like you are, and I've had the same anxiety and quite frankly, some of the same fears about my children when they went through this process, were they making the best choice, were they gonna get into the school that they wanted to get into? And I'm going through that with a high school student right now. And also from the perspective of someone who has evaluated applications from students who are really, really talented and really trying to understand and having spent a lot of time thinking about it, what is it about all of these students who have really good grades, really good test scores, strong curriculum, what is it about some of these students that make them most appealing in terms of, of admitting them to our particular university, as opposed to others who are also in many ways, very outstanding academic students. We're gonna talk about that uh, as we proceed. So let's go ahead, let's move forward. And the first thing that we're gonna do is to look at the lay of the land. What are we looking at right now? okay, in admissions, in the Ivy League schools, and some of the other top universities as well. What you're seeing right here is uh, an admissions uh, rate chart. It looks over 
a period of about five years, and you're looking at essentially here the Ivy League universities. And what is it? The first thing that you notice is that these admit rates are really low, right? These schools are not easy uh, to get into. But guess what? Somebody is getting admitted to these universities. Now, is it happenstance that students are getting admitted? Is it luck? I'm sure there's, there's a part of that that's involved in this process. But for the most part, one of the things that I was able to analyze and spend some time doing while at Duke and also reflecting as an academic advisor on how students performed who once they came to Duke who did well, what was their profile in high school, there are certain things that some students are doing better than others in this process. And that is really what universities will really focus on. And we're gonna talk with a specificity on what universities are looking for. But the point that I'm making here is that even though these admit numbers look daunting, even though they look daunting, there is a process, there is a method to how to, in my opinion, improve your chances for being admitted. And I think greatly improving your chances for being admitted in, the, in, in this particular process. The other thing that you will notice when you look at this chart, and let's actually go to the right and look at the trend line here. You'll notice that over time, the admit rates are getting lower, okay? Now, what does that really mean? Does it mean that the universities are trying to make it more difficult for your students to be admitted? And the answer to that question strongly, in my, in my opinion, is no. They're not trying to make it more difficult, but what they are facing is a growing applicant pool year after year after year. And for the most part, they have a fixed amount of space. So naturally you're going to start seeing with more applications, a smaller, a lower percentage. But you're also gonna notice something pretty interesting here. When you look at 2020, really the year of the pandemic, and you look at 2021, you will start to notice that there is a fairly steeper decline in the trend line, right? So the admit numbers are going down. And what does that reflect? Well, essentially what happened in 2020 is that many schools made testing optional. SAT, ACT testing. So many students who otherwise would not have applied to these universities sort of jumped into the pool and said, you know what, I'm gonna give it a shot. So you see schools, universities like Harvard University, uh, for example, that had from, year, from one year to the next, an increase from 40,000 to 57,000 applicants. It's fairly, it's fairly significant. But that's generally why you saw sort of this year going into 2021, where the numbers seem to have tanked uh, in significant ways. Nevertheless, even with these greater numbers of students who are applying within the pool, it's my opinion that when you look at statistics, and I tried to study this kind of fairly, fairly carefully, what was going on here? If you did not submit an a, a, a test score, were you a student who was at a disadvantage, right? Did, universities in some ways penalize students who did not submit test scores. My belief is that no, they did not. But what I think happened is if you look at the statistics, the students who did not submit test scores were admitted at a lower rate than students who did. But I believe that is because the students who did not, the ones who decided to jump into the pool, overall, when you were looking at a lot of their other credentials, tended to be a little softer a little bit weaker than the students that were submitting them. Does that mean that a student who doesn't have great test scores should not submit those tests, should not apply to a particular school? Absolutely not. These schools are admitting students who are not submitting test scores. But I don't want to go off on, uh, on an aside uh, in that discussion, but just really wanting you to understand that there is a method to the madness and that your child with, with, with good preparation early planning can really have a good chance to get admitted to these schools despite them being very difficult. Now, if you look here, you'll see uh, these are some of the other top select schools. Of course, I've got Duke up there. You're seeing essentially the same trends here, right? Same, same sort of trends, downward trends over time. 2020, 2021, these schools uh, engaged in the same uh, test optional policies and you start to see they got a lot of applicants and you started to see this, these numbers go down in, in a fairly 
uh, significant, significant way. Nevertheless, I plan, I encourage wherever my students want to go to school, we're gonna work hard to get them to make them very competitive in this pool. And I'm gonna show you uh, in a moment just how we, we work through that. But let me tell you about the importance, the tremendous importance in early preparation in this process, having your application prepared, having your credentials prepared early in the process. If we look here, what we're looking at now is we're looking at early sort of restrictive early action, early decision versus regular admissions comparison, okay? And this is for the Ivy League and for the other top sort of top universities that we see. If we look at the graduating class of 2024, and we've got the 2025 numbers out as well, but if we look at the graduating class of 2024, you'll see that for a student that applied to Harvard University restrictive early action, there was a 14% admit rate, right? So 14 out of every 100 students were being admitted. The regular decision rate was significantly lower. Overall, 5%. And that number's dragged down because there's so many students in a regular decision pool who are applying. That's why we get this rate down to about 5%. When we look at the graduating class of 2025 for Harvard, the restrictive early action rate actually went down to probably about 7.8%. And their overall rate now is somewhere in the range of about 3.8%. So there really was a decrease in their admit rate uh, through REA. But nevertheless, that rate is still significantly higher than the regular rate. And for many schools, they did not have that sort of decrease going into their graduating class of 2025 like Harvard did. But still, as you, if you look here carefully, you see that being in a position that when you enter the fall of your senior year and you can have your application, your credentials and your profile built and in great shape going into mid-October, early November or the 1st of November, that's when we need to be targeting the schools that we really are interested in, in, in attending, okay? And we see some of the same things for these other universities. Let's look specifically then at the class of 2025 at the University of Pennsylvania. Here you see there are 56,000 total applicants in the pool and an overall admit rate of 5.9%, right? So this is the total number that they, that they admitted. Early decision applicants, 7,000, they admitted 14.9%, 15%, okay? Now we drop down to the regular decision and we've got 48,000 applicants who are applying for maybe not even two thirds, two thirds of the, the remaining seats, right? That's a lot of students. Admit rate 4.4%. University of Pennsylvania takes about half their class, a little bit more, right? Through their, almost, through their, uh, their early decision process. Okay, so now let's, let's move on. But what this points out, early preparation is everything. Now, I wanna share, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about test scores. That sometimes I think we put a little bit too much emphasis on, on test scores. But if you look here, you'll see ACT test scores, sort of the middle 50% for the IVs, roughly in that 33, 34 range, okay? Test scores are a part of the process. They have been for many, many years, but sometimes, uh, parents can be overly focused on them to a tremendous detriment of the other aspects of what their students should be involved in and what their students should be doing. We can look here at the SAT test score averages. And what we see here is that really the middle 50% for these schools are going to be somewhere from about 1480 to 1520. At the end of the day, I will share this with you. Universities ultimately admit whom they want to admit. There are numbers, there are parameters that they certainly look at, but based upon the certain strengths that a student can bring to their university and connection and alignment that they make with that university, for whatever reason, for whatever purpose, these scores can be, you can have students who are below these scores and admit it to the universities. And there, of course, there's students who are well above that who are. So the testing has, has been just a part of the measurement. 
What is my feeling about testing? My feeling about testing is that now schools are really in that sort of experimental phase with testing, right? This thing is really in flux right now. And they're going from year to year. My belief is that in the future, they will go permanently test optional. That's my, that's my thinking. I think that's going to ultimately be the trend and they're figuring out how well they're able to navigate with that process. Now. Okay. All right, now, <clears throat> How do universities evaluate applications? I want you to understand this is different from what they're looking for. And I'm gonna explain that in a minute. Most universities are going to consider these six areas, your curriculum, your grades, your tests, extracurricular activities, essays, and recommendations. Now you'll see down here, of course, I have tests, I have SAT2, subject tests, that's no longer administered, okay, the subject test. But I, I, I jump ahead of myself here. Every university has its own method of evaluating applications. But you best be sure that they have a method for it. And this is the way that they can make sure that within their staff of admissions officers, they are making consistent decisions, explainable decisions internally. Now, they're gonna be looking at interviews and universities use interviews in different ways and they weight them in different ways. They may look through your application and be looking at some of your background history and the opportunities that they think that your parents may have provided you where other students may not have that, those opportunities, give some consideration to your geographical background, your economic background, some of those different things. But generally speaking, these are kind of the, area, the, the main areas that they're gonna consider. The curriculum, they're going to look at how tough is your curriculum? How much have you taken advantage of the rigor that exists within your high school? So they're gonna look at how many college level courses you've taken, okay? Which is in some, respects measured by advanced placement courses. Okay, they look at how many you've taken. Or the International Baccalaureate Diploma Program, and they look at that, it's a rigorous program, and certainly they look at the number of higher levels that you've taken within that. There's also something called A-levels that typically that you'll see that from uh, European applicants and those from the Caribbean. And then of course, uh, there's that Chinese national curriculum, which is considered uh, a rigorous curriculum in the pool. But they want to look at how strong that curriculum is. They're also going to look at your grades. Now, often parents think about, and students think about, well, my GPA is this, can I get in, or what? The, the GPA is something that it generally represents how well you've done, but it's really a static moment, right? It's like a moment in time. What they're really looking at is they're going to look at the grades that you received in all of your courses, primarily your core courses, your, your math, your science, your foreign language, uh, your humanities, social science, those, those courses. And they're gonna look at how you've done over time in those courses. Are you on a trend line upward? Are you on a trend line downward? Are you at a uh, consistent high level? Downward grade trends are not good. Uh, one of the things that we found, uh, particularly from the academic advising standpoint, was that students who were in a downward grade trend in their junior year statistically would continue into a, a downward grade trend even through up through the first semester of college. So it's sort of the, one of those statistical things. So admissions people are kind of like, well, that's not something we'd like to see. Students that have it a little shaky in their freshman year, and that's understandable, and but they work their way up, that's something that admissions people like to see, right? But overall, you need to do well with respect to your grades. The same thing with your, your test scores. You're submitting test scores, you want them to be really good test scores, right? Well within that middle 50%. So they're gonna look at that. And for some international students, the schools look at the TOEFL. TOEFL is this one of several uh, uh, English fluency exams that are taken by interna international students. But here is the most important thing to keep in mind. Doing well in your curriculum and your grades and your test scores is necessary in order to be considered for admission, but it is not enough to get you admitted to these schools. Okay. 
Curriculum grades and test scores are very important to get you considered for admission, but not enough to get you admitted. Where the schools are going to look at in order to make distinctions among all of these students who are really strong in those areas, they have to be able to make nuanced distinctions among them in order to make those decisions that yes, we want to admit the student. They look for evidence through looking at your extracurricular activities, they look at your essays, they look at your recommendations, and any other information that they may be able to pull together through interviews and, and, and so on, okay? So let's look at this hypothetical situation where you have 40,000 applicants, right? Let's say roughly, and I know in Duke University's case, 20,000 or more students are gonna not, are just simply not gonna be competitive. And for whatever reason, lack of curriculum strength, bad grade trends, um, and in, in the case before test optional where tests were submitted for testing, right? Now, universities have to have a way to, to process all of these thousands and thousands of applications. If you think about it, many of these admissions offices have 20, 25, maybe 30, uh, and particularly the large li private liberal arts universities on their staff. And they've got to process 40, 57,000 applications. So, so they have methods for streamlining that. And one of the ways to do that is actually looking at weakness in these areas, curriculum grades and test scores. But what about the remaining group? Whatever that number may be, that remaining 20,000, they all look very similar in these areas of curriculum grades and test scores. And this is where the, the universities start to lean heavily and understanding more about you and your thinking. Now, we're gonna talk about what they're looking for in just a moment, but I just wanted to give you some context, right? They take the remaining 20,000. These are the students, we used to use the term, these are the students we need to talk about in our committees, we need to talk about. And then we make decisions maybe of admitting maybe 7.5% or so of that to build our class, okay? Now, let's start to scratch the surface of what these universities are looking for. Any of you who've been to information sessions or any of the online information sessions or uh, when they were having them in person, you would hear the term often admissions officers would use is that you know, our, what we're looking for is a good fit between the student and ourselves, a good match, right? Okay, what does this generally mean? Now, the first thing that a student should understand and family should understand is every university has a mission. Every, in just about all organizations, if they're, if they're organized well, will have a mission statement. Well, universities have mission statements. It's a mission, it's the way, it's, it's their governing philosophy. If you look at MIT, you can go to MIT's website right now and look up their mission statement. And the mission statement says a number of things, but one of the things that it says is that they are in the business of preparing, I'm paraphrasing now, in the business of preparing engineers to go out into the world and make the world a better place, right? Now we know that it is a, essentially a, a scientific technological based school, but they, have, they do have liberal arts there. But their focus is really going to be in areas of mathematics and physics and engineering and high level computer science, it's who they are. Harvard, Stanford have engineering programs. Duke University has an engineering program. University of Pennsylvania, they have engineering programs. But nowhere are you going to see in their mission statement do they say that they're preparing engineers to go out into the world and make the world a better place. They do that, but they don't say that because they have a broader sort of a broader foundation focus on liberal arts, combining those scientific areas, those computer science areas with a strong appreciation in humanities and in the social sciences as well. It's a mission, it's who they are. So if you're a student who is really hell bent on philosophy and public policy, maybe an MIT, a Caltech is not really the place for you if that's what your back, all but your background shows, right? There is something else that you have to understand. What are the core values of that particular university? Very important to know these. What, is it, what are the core values? They all have values. One of the values that all universities have 
Typically, when a student arrives at orientation, many universities have you sign off on a code of honor, which essentially says, I will not engage in academic dishonesty. I won't cheat, right? We're going to bring integrity to the campus environment. That's important to us. Well, everybody has that. But there are other things that schools value. The value, the process of learning and how one learns, right? How do you learn? Well, one of the things that you may have heard of the term knocked around is interdisciplinary learning. That is a belief that students learn best when they understand how different fields and disciplines connect together to solve problems. How does sociology and data science and environmental science and economics, how does it come together to address issues? Issues of health, issues of poverty. How do they come together? Universities are very interested in this. And if you go to any, just about any of their websites now, you'll see them talking about interdisciplinary learning. Stanford, I mean, you name it, you'll see it, okay? It's an important value. The other thing that they know is that they have many academic opportunities at their school. And are students going to take advantage of it? How well does a student align with those opportunities that we have on our campus? And that's what they're always looking for. They're always looking for and trying to pick up in an application. They also have extracurricular opportunities, four or 500 or more clubs that cross academic areas and service areas. Is a student going to be engaged and involved with that? There's an expression in admissions called, show me, don't tell me. Don't tell me you're interested in this. Show me what you've done. Demonstrate what you've done. Demonstrate your interest so that we get a sense that if you come to our university, you're going to continue to engage in that and be impactful in our community. So from the student standpoint and the student side, that's what they're looking at, your interest, your experiences, your talents and your skills and trying to understand how that works together with mission, core values, academic opportunities, extracurricular opportunities that exist. That's this general sense of match, that general sense of fit, okay? Now, that's still general, right? I'm still talking sort of general stuff, but it's important that you understand sort of this overarching sense of how uh, admissions people kind of look, begin to look at this process. Now the question becomes that people ask is, what are they looking for? Really, what are they looking for, okay? I have an opinion, a very strong opinion about what they look for, okay? It's really this. Universities are looking for students, and I'm not just talking about Ivy League schools or other top schools. I'm talking, there, there are many, many very, very good schools out here. They're looking for students who think deeply about ideas, engage those ideas, engage other people, and can align those ideas and that engagement with the opportunities that exist within the university. To me, it's that simple. You think deeply about ideas and you have to demonstrate that. You engage those, uh, those, those ideas in many ways. We're gonna show, I'm gonna show you that, the ways that you do that through your clubs and research and other work efforts. You engage other people. Why do you engage other people? You engage other people to show the university that you're concerned about something that's greater than just yourself. They're not interested in people who are just gonna to go to the classroom, get good grades, graduate and go on to, to, to have great careers and make great money. That's fine, they know that's going to happen and we all want that to happen for our, for our students. But they wanna know that you're going to be concerned about your community at the university, making a difference at the university, being concerned about other people, and taking the skills and knowledge that you develop at the universities and going out and helping to make the world and make your community a better place. That's important. And this is why in admissions meetings, there's a question that we ask frequently. And we ask in a student's school, what is the level of that student's visibility in the school? That's another way of asking what is their impact in their high school? So that we can try to extrapolate whether or not they're gonna be bringing that within our community. So here, most importantly, you see, they really like students who love thinking hard about things. And folks, it can be anything. A student who thinks hard about music, 
a student who thinks hard about physics, a student who thinks hard about public policy or social justice issues, it's okay, it doesn't matter, but that they think deeply about something and they put their heart and their soul in the area that interests them. Okay, that's what they're looking for. They engage those ideas, as I've mentioned earlier, and they engage other people. Now, <clears throat> if you think that I've just come up with this, let me kind of show you some things here that matter. Let's take a look at some of the essay prompts, examples of essay prompts from the 2021-2022 cycle. This is Carnegie Mellon. Actual question. Most students choose their intended major or area of study based on a passion or inspiration that's developed over time. What passion or inspiration led you to choose this area of study? Passion or inspiration that's developed over time. This is not something you come up with automatically when you're applying for schools. Well, I'm interested in this, right? It's something that has developed over time, something that you wanna be in a position to demonstrate how this is developed, right? Let's take a look at this next one, Yale. Yale's extensive course offerings and vibrant conversations beyond the classroom encourage students to follow their what? Developing, just like they say developed, developing intellectual interests wherever they lead, wherever those interests lead. Tell us about your engagement with a topic or idea, right? Developing intellectual interest. This is why preparation and planning is important. The earlier, the better. But we're gonna show you also, in one of my cases, a student who kind of developed this was kind of narrow and developed things a little bit late, but I'll show you that in a moment. Let's take a look at Stanford. The Stanford community is deeply curious and driven to learn in and out of the classroom. Reflect on an idea or an experience that makes you genuinely excited about learning. Reflect on an idea or experience that makes you genuinely excited about learning, right? And if you're genuinely excited about learning, this can't be an idea that you just came up with. It's got to be something that you've taken your time and you've thought about deeply, you've engaged it. If we go and we look here, we can now look at Princeton University. Princeton allows students to explore areas across the humanities and the arts, the natural sciences and the social sciences. What they're talking about is this idea of a liberal arts education, this idea of interdisciplinary learning, right? They're, they're putting that out there. So what academic areas most, most pique your curiosity? And then how do the programs offered at Princeton suit your particular interests? So they're asking two questions. The second question is, is how does your interest align with Princeton, with the programs that are offered? That's a big question. They, sometimes they don't ask it directly like that, but that's really what they're trying to figure out, okay? And they wanna know what academic areas most pique your curiosity? Well, that's something again, that you need to be able to explain. How did you come to develop that academic area over time? MIT does something similar. It says, pick what field of study at MIT appeals to you, All right? Alignment, what appeals to you the most right now? And tell us more about why this field of study appeals to you. That why part is what you've got to explain. And you've got to, and it's got to be based on something more than, well, it's just popped in my idea. It seems like it's a nice field, right? Okay. So I just want to give you this, I, this understanding that principally, the schools are really focused on understanding students who think deeply about something, deeply about stuff, deeply about ideas, engage those ideas, engage others, and align them with the university. Okay. Now, this is really sort of how I would look at some things. And this is really my drill point because I'm gonna drill down when we get ready to start the case study to show you how this works. But when I start to think about the pre-application period, some of the planning period with my students and these grades doesn't matter, this could be ninth grade, could be 10th grade. Uh, they're just here for purposes of illustration. So, but for the 10th grade uh, and, and again, starting as early as possible is fine you've got to identify an academic interest. That's the first thing that you want to do. A student needs to identify that academic interest. What is it that interests them? 
Now, there's certain ways that I've worked with my students to really get them thinking about them, thinking about the ideas, thinking about their interests. One is just TED Talks. Why TED Talks? TED Talks, eight minutes, 10 minutes, 12 minutes, doesn't take up much of your time. But what do you have in TED Talks? You have people who are thinking deeply about ideas. It is good for students to look at TED Talks frequently because in an area that they think they might have an interest so that they can learn and say, hey, I really do have an interest in that. This, what this person is saying is very interesting. But then as they start to listen to these people, they think, they, they begin to understand how they think beyond just the top, the first level. We have many students, if you ask uh, a student, well, what's your interest? Uh, I'm interested in computer science. I'm interested in biology. What does that mean? I'm interested in economics. What does that mean? Those are broad fields that doesn't give an answer to much of anything. But suppose you say, well, I'm interested in engineering. I'm particularly interested in uh, its, its, its relationship with computer science, artificial intelligence, machine learning with a specific application to self-driving technology and specifically the, the, the issues of safety that they're dealing with right now. Right now. What's keeping the Tesla engineers up at night who are developing, continuing to develop and advance or autopilot? What are those issues? What are some of the public policy issues that go beyond the science? What kind of cooperation can they get governmental? Thinking deeper about these types of issues, right? TED Talks are one example. This Harvard EDX online, it's free. Well, most of it's free just about probably 80% of it's free, that your child can take a course self-paced and learn and, and take it typically self-paced. They budget you for maybe six weeks. And you can learn about something that may be of an interest to you. What about Coursera? Free resources, right? I also want my students to keep, as they go through this process, a diary to reflect on everything that they've done. Every activity keep a diary, keep a section for that particular area so they can come back and they can reflect on it. When they start writing these essays, that's gonna be pretty important for them because a lot of students write essays ultimately and they forget all the rich details of the things that they've done. And, and the richness of your essays often in the details, right? College essay prompts are out there. You have access to them now. You can look at them. And people say they change. Folks, they don't change that much when they change, right? If they change a little bit still, it's gonna be generally the same thing. And they do change. I mean, you have new administrations come in, new leadership, and they typically will come and change the, the essay prompts. But looking at essay prompts right now is like getting test questions two weeks in advance of the test. That will help inform your thinking, right? and really inform your thinking about when you're engaged in activities, hey, I need to think about this better. I need to pay more attention to what I'm doing in this activity because it will help me address these types of questions that are being asked by the university. Does that make sense? These are things, so the process, we don't control the admissions process, right? I have no impact on those decisions that these people make in the admissions office, okay? Your students won't, you won't. But what we wanna do is control as much of this as we can in this process, to learn as much as we can. Take those essay prompts early, start looking at them, thinking about the schools that you may inter be interested in, maybe five or six or seven schools, okay? School clubs, great way. I'll, I'll show you exactly how one of my students, Jenny, did that. Using school clubs, you develop your interest. Now, the other thing that you do once you identify your interest is you start to build depth around that interest, right? Depth, depth, you learn more, you get to understand it. You can do that through just your high school course selection combined with school club selection, online summer college courses and programs, tutoring, mentor, mentorship, portfolio development, one-on-one -on -one tutoring and mentorship, artistic supplements, portfolio development, working, engaging, developing and learning. Now I'm talking generally now, but when we look at the case study, you're gonna see specifically how this stuff works to really develop a student and develop their mind and to think deeply about different things, right? Now, let me just take a pause for one minute. Uh, 
you see uh, uh, everyone that I am on the Ivy Compass platform. And we are now joined at the hip. I am exclusive with Ivy Compass. Why? Because having spent time in getting to know the platform, as well as the other support platforms that exist, there are tremendous resources that are offered here. And I work, I'm very much into building my students' profile, building their brand, building them. And there are lots of resources out here that are all over the place and you're unable to necessarily measure the quality of those resources. I've spent a great deal of time with the folks who are part of the organization and to learn and to drill down and understand what the opportunities are that they offer. So that we now work very closely together so that I can, can identify specific areas as necessary that I can, I can direct my students to, I monitor and know that they're getting very good quality in that regard. And therefore it has worked out to be a very good, very good union for us. We'll talk more about that a little bit later, okay? Now, the next thing that I want you to understand is that then we do advanced building of depth. Advanced building of building through internships, research, paper publications, college courses and programs. And then we kind of finalize our college selection based on our profile. That helps us to kind of identify what colleges we're going to be looking at uh, more carefully, okay? The other thing that I have not mentioned yet, which I will show you as part of this is that we do something that is project-based, that's field-based work where we're actually engaged in the community doing things. Let me share this with you. I'm going I'm to put this out there in advance just before the case study because we're going to be getting ready to go there in, in, in just a moment. Universities are very, very interested in students who are able to take their knowledge, their, what they've learned, and apply that knowledge. Okay. What they like to see with students are students who are able to identify a problem, analyze the problem, and then propose a solution. Identify a problem, analyze it, propose a solution, or it may be a number of issues. And, these, and this can relate to their local community, their school, or something even greater than that. And then take that in a project, in a field, and, and make something happen with it that can in some way improve something that could be small or something that's large, doesn't matter. It's the, it's the opportunity for the universities to observe that happening that's important, okay? But we'll see that in the case study in just a minute, okay? Now, when we go from this pre-application planning period and we go to the uh, application, <clears throat> we see uh, as I work with my students, we will work together, we analyze essays and techniques used by successful applicants, right? So why not, look, we're gonna create our own story, but it is good to see how other people have thought about issues to help you with your thinking, along with all the other things that are, are there in your background, right? We brainstorm the essay topics. We edit and provide this sort of expert guidance during the essay drafts. And during the application period, I meet with my students weekly, okay, to monitor and guide progress. It's a lot of work, but it delivers results, okay? Uh, and then, of course, we go through, we review all the application submissions, we review and provide guidance for the resume, maintain schedule for timely submission of work, teacher selection for recommendations. We talk about best teachers to, to, to use for your recommendations. So it's a, it's a whole encompassed you know, plan of action for how we work with the students. Now, let me just give you an example here. This is another broad example. Last one, I think, before my case study starts is let's take a look at a student who's interested in say business or finance, pre-business or, or finance. Now, sometimes it can be argued, I have students say, well, I'm interested in business. And I say, well, what does that mean, right? You know, there's this, this issue of, you know, business for profit, making money, all that does make it awkward for us in terms of discussing it with schools. I don't think so. I think that there's a way to do it. We engage in business for one reason. Ultimately, it should be that we serve others, that we serve mankind, we serve our communities in some way through business. Yes, we make a profit on it, that's the goal, but everything that we do should serve. Zoom serves, makes money, but it serves a purpose, right? Amazon serves a purpose, right? And through that, many people were able to work at home comfortably. 
during the pandemic, it's service. So we're able to tie business in, or we can go into the broader area of economics. But the way that students are able to do that can, can be done through uh, uh, newspaper articles, writing papers, articles about things that are of interest to them. Why? Sharing knowledge, sharing important knowledge about something that's important to them with others, helping to advance the cause of your community or your school about something that's been important to you. That's why newspaper is great for students. Of course, internships are there. It shows your commitment to learning more, being engaged. And you could take a snapshot of this and, and look, I'm not gonna go through all of those different uh, uh, texts here. Websites and blogs where you bring people together who have uh, like interest, okay. Building that community, sharing your knowledge about something that's interested within the context of, 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 of business, your passion. Uh, research and finance and economics, doing those sorts of things, working one-on-one -on -one with a mentor in this area, uh, entrepreneurship clubs, summer classes or programs. There are many, many ways you can take and start to fashion all of this to show a school that, hey, this is something that I'm committed to. This is something I'm committed to learning more about and that the things that I've done, I will continue to do and expand upon with the help of your university and then take it into the world one day and make this world as best I can a better place. My community, the world, my nation, okay? All right, now let's get to one other area. What are the common mistakes that students make? What should you avoid? Well, we talked a little bit about this already and, and parents. You start the college planning process late. Well, we can wait, we can wait, we can wait. Well, but we don't think that way for retirement, right? Who starts to plan their retirement and save money at 60 years of age? But somehow it's possible that we do that with our students in high school. The planning process, regardless of the schools that you're thinking about, should start as early as possible. And it's a mistake to start late, but can you start late and recover? Yes, you can. You can do that, and I'll show that in a moment. Failure to build the student's brand or profile around interest, and that is where the student is doing a little bit of everything. And quite frankly, for most high school students, that's what they do. And then apply to schools, they fill out the application, do all the things that the schools request, and hand it over to the admissions office and say, please take me, right? And there's no rhyme or reason to the application. So building a brand and building that profile, I think is very important. The other thing is that families and, and, and particularly parents singly focus on grades, competitive achievements and test scores. Okay. And that is a big no-no because there are so many students who also have phenomenal grades, competitive achievements, great test scores. There's no way to distinguish among those students at all for schools. Those students are a dime a dozen, quite honestly. And I don't mean to say that in a bad, in a negative way. It doesn't sound great, but it's true in the admissions process, right? The hard work for the admissions office is being able to distinguish among that big pool of really bright, talented students, right? So this is something that you don't want to be singly focused. They're gonna be important, but not singly focused. Again, no reasoning or incorrect reasoning behind your activity involvement. And this goes behind, this goes hand in hand with number two, failure to build the student's brand or profile around the interest. Okay, so we're just kind of doing things. The other is follow the herd mentality or do as your friends or neighbors do. Now we've all heard this before. Friends say, well, you know, we've heard you really need to get in this program. Uh, it costs, you know, and the program might cost your family six or $7,000 completely unrelated to furthering your interest and demonstrating your interest, but they say, that's what the universities like for you to do this. I like for you to do that. How do they know this, right? And so for my families, when I work with them, if they're going to spend money, I want to make sure that it is a return on their investment and it advances everything that we're trying to accomplish for their particular student, right? So one of the things, the herd mentality, kind of stay away from that. Do your own research, work with the counselor, work, you know, work with someone who is knowledgeable about this process. Okay. Okay. All right, guys. So now we're going to get to the good stuff. We're going to go to these case studies. Okay. 
All right. This is something that I kind of developed just because it made sense to me when we talk about ideas. And I think this is really what your child needs to do. Everybody has a way to think about this, um, but my way of thinking about it for my students is in, in a, in a step-by-step way. The first thing that we're gonna do is we identify, there's an identification of interest. We develop depth of thinking. We engage the idea, we engage others, and we create an alignment with the university's opportunities. For me, it's that simple. It's the elite paths, EDU's idea method, okay? So that's what I tell my students, put that in your diary, put it in your pocket, because that's gonna guide us all the way to application and acceptance, all righty? Okay, let's move on. Okay, so here is, I'd like for you all to really, really, if you can pay attention, we're gonna drill down. I'm sorry there's so much up here, but uh, to do this case study right, you've gotta do it with particularity. OK, so I want you to bear with me and I want you to pay attention if you can carefully. Uh, here's a student. Uh, one of my students, she was admitted uh, restrictive early action to uh, Stanford University. I'm not going to put you know, certain things that are blanked out for privacy reasons. Uh, there's not much here that I'm going to share in terms of academics. It's, you know, four or five weighted uh, SAT 1540. OK. That's not the important stuff. There are a whole lot of students even with better academics than Jenny in this process. Now, I want you to take a look at her academic interests, okay? And her academic interests here are mental health awareness and treatment, income disparities, wealth gap and social justice, social media impact on our discourse and computer science. Now, I want you to notice something carefully. She applied to Stanford. Jenny is an Asian student. In this, her activities, we don't do and focus much at all on computer science. Stanford has got more than enough people applying who are interested in computer science. Okay. She talks about computers indirectly in terms of her interest in social media but we don't focus at all on computer science, okay? Now, let's go through this, pro this process. How does she develop her interest in these areas? Well, there are a number of different ways that she developed her interest. But the first, one of the first core ways that she did it was through philosophy club. Where's that? In her high school, competing in ethics bowls, all right? Great place to go to learn to think about stuff deeply. That and debate. What did she do? Prepare daily case studies on countless topics for competition. Okay, you say, oh, and? Well, what's the benefit of that activity? The benefit of that activity is that Jenny explored her thinking regarding issues of right, wrong, fairness, equity, and morality. This caused her to think often and deeply about what the human condition. And for her, it's centered around mental health, income disparities, wealth, social justice, the impact of social media on how we treat one another now. This is what she came to think of in a very legitimate, real way through that. And then of course, she was engaged with TED Talks, Harvard EDX and Punsera, right? All of this continued to help inform her thinking on these topics. You look at TED Talks, they have over 4,000 videos that you can look at instantaneously on everything that you might want to, to think about. Then we have, so she did, identified her interests in these areas kind of pretty early on. And then she has different things that she did to build depth. And I didn't necessarily put this in any kind of order. She first did research and investing scholar program at a university, a national university to examine the impact of wealth gap among demographic communities, initiated a policy forward solution using financial literacy, credit building, and home ownership. We'll talk more about this with her essays. Okay. The benefit of the activity was the application of knowledge to problem solving. Remember we talked about that? Here we have another program, Cognition Research at another university. 
the study of electroencephalogram technology as a methodology for the efficient and inexpensive study of changes in brain behavior. Because now she's trying to really understand mental health, right? Really get, get focused on that area. The benefit of this activity was that it was building depth in the myriad of ways to understand mental health pathologies. Okay. Now, again, we go over, now she has a lot of activities and for the sake of time, I couldn't put all the things that she was doing up here. So I'm just highlighting these areas that I think are, are, are important. We have what I call now the engagement of others in project-based field activity work. She's a youth organizer for Asian American Network, okay? She lobbied for high priority legislation to address disparities in mental health access. She addresses this in a short answer Stanford essay, which we're going to see in a moment, okay? All right. We then look here, she's got Teen Science Alliance associated with a particular museum of science. She designed and implemented a mental health app, right? And her app actually is on display now at this particular, particular museum. This is real applicable work that's designed to help people, right? She's the founder of a mental health awareness club initiate meetings to plan and coordinate execution of annual health awareness celebrations and facilitate bi-weekly meetings for educational outreach to student and community members. What's the benefit of the activity? Demonstrated concern for others and the education of others in a field of which she has passion. And she shows concern about something that is what is greater than just herself. We went through this pandemic in 2020. She initiated a $7,500 GoFundMe for area medical staff, people who were also being debilitated by COVID, right? Benefit, demonstration of support and service to others, particularly in regard to the people who work within mental health medical services. Now, I want you to look back here. Keep this in mind as we go to the next page because we started to strategize Okay, what are the schools that you're interested in? And she generally, she looked at a lot of different schools, which she did, and applied to several. But her number one dream school was Stanford. So, okay, we drilled down on Stanford at this point, right? There are certain things we already knew. We did our research and our intelligence on, on Stanford. Mental health awareness and treatment, income disparities, wealth gap and social justice, social media impact on our discourse. Right? Well, you can tell based on all this time, all these different years, we were thinking about this early on, right? So let's take a look. Let's look at this uh, essay. Now, Stanford has a number of essays. They have a number of short answer essays, about five short answer essays where you have 50 words. You got to answer in 50 words limit, right? But here's the thing that we did. We knew, we looked and knew Stanford has, and this is in with respect to social media. Stanford has a social media lab, okay? Interesting. The social media lab works on understanding psychological and interpersonal processes in social media, right? Mental health, psychological processes. This is right on target with what Jenny's interests are, right? And then down here, uh, specifically says in using social is using social media helpful or harmful to your well-being. This is a lot of what they're researching and trying to understand. Okay. So initially what she says in one of the questions, it says, what is the most significant challenge that society faces today? Our political and social discourse lacks empathy. From Instagram comment sections to athletic board meetings to legislative forums, I've observed the trend away from respectful dialogue that stalls progress. Rather than division, I believe effective change should be prioritized through diverse representation of perspectives and emphasis on shared values. So she comes out and lets you know in a very broad way, this is my concern with social media, okay? But this question doesn't really allow her to dig down into the specifics and the more minutia of social media and the, psych and the psychological impact that it has on people, right? But guess what? Stanford has some longer answer essays. She's able to tag it 
right on point here. It says the Stanford community is deeply curious and driven to learn in and out of the classroom. Reflect on an idea or an experience that makes you genuinely curious about learning. So this is her response. I've got to go through this, folks, because this is really, really important. Okay. On a given day, any of the following posts could appear on my Instagram feed. A selfie posted by my friend from Spain, right? So we're all doing selfies. We walk down the street, we do selfies. Everybody's you know, not paying attention to selfies in cars, all of these sorts of things. So she says in philosophy club, now look at what she does here, clever. She goes back to one of her activities here, right? Philosophy club. In philosophy club, we discuss the impact of social media on what human behavior, emotion and relationships. I'm fascinated by the way human connections has evolved digitally and how our codependency with social media affects our mental health and everyday interactions, right? We're stuck in our computers. I mean, on our, our, our handheld computers. Then she goes on and she says, now remember, this is what's appearing on her Instagram feed. An advertisement urging me to purchase the newest brand of organic salsa water. I first learned about the powerful role of social media algorithms in the ethics bowl case titled Data Violence. Look at what she's done here. She's gone right back to her philosophy club and ethics bowl competition, right? She's reminding them of this. I first learned about the powerful role of social media algorithms in an ethics bowl case titled Data Violence. These algorithms analyze our behavior thinking patterns and even possess the ability to shape our emotions. Social media's discrete influence on our wants and needs stimulates my interest in understanding these algorithms that contribute to bias and privacy infringements. So she ties in and goes back and looks at a club that she was involved in, the competition she was involved in, and she still hits them again with this whole idea, this whole idea of, of, of health, mental health, psychological impact. She keeps going back to it and driving it and driving it home. Okay, and then she says here, number three, an infographic I designed to share the history of Chinese Americans in a certain place, strive to employ social media as a tool to empower others and share resources. I'm curious about the role social media can play in social justice movements, how it can unite causes and individuals from different identities, countries, and age groups. She goes back, she ties it to her interest in issues of social justice, right? All righty. And so this is really how she was able to kind of go in and, and identify, look, they've got an important social media lab there. I'm going to speak to it, okay? And then lastly, she says, I'm drawn to the constantly evolving nature of social media from posting different forms of content to experiment with algorithms to even coding my own social media platform. I'm curious about evolving social media platforms to improve safety, user experience, and impact on human health and community dedicated to advancing humanity in all forms. I'm concerned about other people. And here's how I've done things to address that. Let's go again here, okay? Stanford has a lab, a center for mental health and wellness, all right? It's got specific projects within that lab on human, it's called a human connectomy project for depression and anxiety. This is right down her alley, okay? Now look what Jenny says here. It says, briefly elaborate on one of your extracurricular activities, a job you hold or responsibilities you have for your family. You see folks, this is why you wanna look at prompts early on in your planning. They may change them if they do, if it's completely off, you have to do something new, but you can start planning early and you're ready to, to, to drive home and answer or work in that area. So here it says, I collaborate with legislators proposing solutions to systemic disparities in mental health treatment access. Through verbal and written testimony, I champion bills in support of student mental health, including HB 2949, which passed in May, 2021, providing $300 million in funding uh, for mental health educators. Okay. And she did that along with others, but she was very involved in and very engaged. So they pick up on this, all right? And she can speak to things that are important. This is her alignment with Stanford, 
okay, and what they're doing. Now, this I'm not. This is a, is exactly the same essay that you saw previously on the previous slide, uh, but it also addresses the mental health issues that that you see here. Okay. Now we also are. are, are she's showing her experience relevant relative to poverty and inequality. Well, guess what? Stanford has a center on poverty and inequality, right? And they're doing specific research within that. And areas such as income and wealth, her also, her interest is on discrimination and poverty, right? Health, housing, these are all issues that are important to her, okay? And so they ask you, you know, what historical moment or event do you wish you could have witnessed? I wish I could have spoken with Oregon lawyer and activist Minoru Yasu following his release from solitary confinement in 1943. After spending nine months in prison for defying his government ordered internment, Yasu's unwavering commitment to his values and Japanese American identity continuously motivates me to choose courage and seek truth, her issue in justice and fairness and human, humanity, the human condition. It speaks to what they're doing at Stanford. Okay. It's not a general, I'm interested in economics. I'm interested in whatever. She's drilling down what she's particularly interested in. It says, how did you spend your last two summers? Okay. 2020, engaged with the National Racial Justice Movement. Co-founded YouthLink, fundraising for medical professionals and teaching free online classes. Coded Bubble, a mental health website for elementary age students, engaging, engaging people. Research at the university investing in, in investigating cognition and comprehension, played piano uh, at a certain you know, jazz online. This was kind of her own fun thing and did some and participated in some leadership seminars. So you see how, and if I had more time, I could really, really drill down with you on all the things that she did, but I don't have the time for that. But this kind of gives you that story of how you put together a profile, you build it, you put it together. This is one of the reasons why Ivy Compass is such a tremendous asset for me is being able to really build powerfully for, for my students uh, in these different types of, of areas. Okay, now we're gonna go now to uh, another student, William. William is admitted to Princeton, restrictive early action this fall. Both of these students were just admitted this fall. Okay. Uh, William, I might call him Billy every now and then. That's what I call him all the time. Um, but now, you look at his, his academics. I'm not going to focus on that. His interest is economics, public policy, political science, computer science. Computer science, again. Guess what? We don't spend time talking about computer science. All right. This is one thing I know that he's going to major in, right? Computer, I know that he's going to do. But this is not what our focus is going to be in that pool at Princeton. Now, here's something that's very interesting. Billy, uh, if you look at his activities are all over the place, and Billy and I started working together uh, in his senior year, and his activities are all over the place. And there's no way, when you just look at this, how do you build a theme for Billy? Now, I will tell you this, excuse me. Many, many students are just like Billy. Most of them are. So how do you work with this particular student? He says, you know what? I really, really want to go to Princeton. I say, okay, well, all right. Well, let's take a look carefully at Princeton. Let's look at a number of other schools, of course. But let's look carefully at Princeton and see what we can focus on here, okay? Uh, you know, we look at the volunteer work, English tutor, Spanish honor society, right? I mean. There's nothing really profound here. But there is one thing that Billy did consistently over four years. And by the way, let me just mention with Jenny, I worked with Jenny early on in, in, in her freshman year and due to her parents' financial situation and a move, we came back together in her last year and, and, worked, and worked fully together. But Billy's case, Billy really... Um, we just had to, we had to really work and drill down and see what we had. Billy here is on a debate team. He's a debate team captain. Now, I, by the way, I love debate and I'll explain why in a moment. But he was a debate team captain and he was a debate team national champion. 
in debate and uh, you know, debate national qualifier. And I kind of looked at this and I looked at this thing and I said, you know what, we're gonna focus on debate. We're gonna focus on debate. We're gonna push debate because debate opens up so many things. Debate is a field which allows students to think on different sides of an issue, to be open-minded, to be quick-witted, to be quick thinking, broad thinking and to spend time doing a lot of work and research outside of class, right? Tremendous assets that the universities love and enjoy. So what we did here, as I said, Billy, we're gonna focus on debate and this is how we're gonna do it. We looked at Princeton, guess what? Let's take a look here. So you can take a look and you see the different things that he did within, within debate, right? But see, debate is grades 9, 10, 11, 12, Billy, this was a sustained, passionate interest over time, a demonstrated interest in debate. The question is, how do we connect it? Well, this is what we did. First thing that we did is, what does debate? Debate allows you to think across so many different areas, so many different disciplines. I said, you know what, Billy? We're going to focus on interdisciplinary learning aspect, the liberal arts of Princeton, the interdisciplinary learning aspect. We're going to focus on that. The other thing that we're going to do is debate, excuse me, Princeton has the oldest debate society in America among university institutions, founded in 1765. It's important to them. Their team ranks consistently in the top 10 in America, top 10 in international rankings. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. Take a look here. This is the uh, president, and I'm sorry that this is real small, this is the president of Princeton, okay? He says, I came to Princeton because I wanted a liberal arts education that would, that would enable me to pursue multiple interests rigorously and deeply. I concentrated in physics, but here's the, here's, here's the, here's the, here's the good part. But the courses that most shaped my intellectual life were in constitutional law, political theory, and comparative literature. That's the humanities part, right? Interdisciplinary learning is the essence of what happens at Princeton. So we're gonna focus on that and we're gonna hammer that home for you. The other thing is, is that if you look down at the undergraduate, you can go right now to their undergraduate admission site, look up fun facts. They have 16 facts under here, fun facts about Princeton, but look at what's number two. Number two is the American Whig Classophic Society is the oldest college literary and debating club in the United States. And then they go on and they talk about who the former graduates are, who participated in the, in the club and all that. That tells me that the debate is very important. So they're thinking now, wow, you know, this guy, he comes to our school, he's gonna participate with something that's very important to us, right? So uh, here, what you have is, let me just go through this because I want you to see the details on how he did this. This is an excerpt from his, his, his essay. So it's not all of it. He says, slowly I began to see debate in a different light. Here's the question, discuss an accomplishment event or realization that sparked a period of personal growth and a new understanding of yourself or others. Now, this is, a, this is, is really like a personal statement, one common application personal statement. So I learned to analyze multiple perspectives of the same problem. Debate wrestles with the intersection of disciplines, science, sociology, politics, seemingly unrelated, but powerfully intertwined and integral in forming solutions to our daily challenges in life. This is speaking to what the very, the president is talking about. They can relate to this. It's on their websites. Their president talks about it and it's talking about debate. And they know this, debaters know what he's saying makes sense, right? He says, the issues I debated weren't simple chess pieces. They were multi-dimensional nuance issues that required analysis analysis through a multitude of lenses. That is different perspectives, okay? He says, I came to understand that in the same vein as Socrates discussing philosophy and Abraham Lincoln challenging Stephen Douglas over the extension of slavery, discourse is the ultimate catalyst for change in the vehicle of progress, knowledge is the fuel and debate is the engine. He's talking, he's talking about that liberal arts nature of, of, of Princeton and most of these schools that are these large liberal arts colleges, right? He's using what he has. He has less than what Jenny had, but he's using what he has and he's hitting home with it. So he's showing that if I come to your school, I'm going to be a person who can reason, 
right? I can debate, I can reason, I can engage in discourse. He says, ultimately, I've evolved to think deeply about issues. Remember, we talk, talked about that deeply about issues that impact my community from a myriad of perspectives. My focus is not on right or wrong, but rather the way that rigorous questioning of ideas serves to ultimately improve what? To improve the human condition. We go back to that, engaging others, improving the human condition. He has less field work than Jim, but he's saying intellectually, this is something I believe in, okay? Through debate, I've learned to appreciate the power of the spoken word, whether that be to educate, resolve conflict, or to create progress. And I wish I could share everything with you about these students in detail, but we simply don't have the time. But I'm, I'm certainly willing to answer questions about that and meet and talk about that process later. Okay, so this is essentially my thinking for these students. Let me share with you that you can do this with any school, any university, right? It's all about planning. It's all about careful thinking. And I give assignments to my students, they have to do them. We have to work through them. It's a plan. If we work the plan, work the plan, I think that we greatly enhance our opportunities to be admitted to some of the top schools. There are no guarantees, of course there aren't. But we try our best to be the most competitive. And I think in many cases, uh, our, our, my, my students are very satisfied. With their, with their results, okay? Now, um, the only thing, the other thing that I wanted to mention here, I'm not gonna spend much time, his, is his experience relative to economics, right? And so he knows that they, they've got a very good economics program there, okay? And they have a real strong interdisciplinary focus there, okay? And so he says, uh, here, he says, I realize, and this is the question, that they talk about as a research institution that also prides itself on its liberal arts curriculum, Princeton allows students to explore areas across the humanities and the arts, the natural sciences and the social sciences. What academic areas most pique your curiosity and how do the programs offered at Princeton suit your particular interests? Well, this is a typical, this is an alignment question, right? How do you align this? And he says, uh, as I learn more about the world through debate, he goes back to the debate. And my academic studies, I developed a profound appreciation for economics. I realized that economic analysis was fundamental to solving many of humanity's challenges. And he goes in specifically and talks about the rising cost of social security, analyzing European uh, wealth tax models gave me one solution, the viability of gene therapy for depression understanding the rising cost of antidepressant drugs was crucial. This is part of his, he had a big capstone project that he worked on related to, to economics, okay? And then he says, I'd love to continue my studies at Princeton's economic department where I can take a number of unique interdisciplinary courses. Now that's kind of pretty standard language right there, but this is what we're working with. We're going back, we're pinpointing things that are very specific to the university, okay? All right, so that really kind of concludes my, my, my conversation about the, uh, uh, about the case studies, okay? Alrighty, now, because uh, we're gonna have to, to, to wrap this up. I just wanna show you, these are actually some emails uh, that I received. This actually came from William. He said, hi, Will. I'm glad to tell you that I received an offer of admission to Princeton just now. Thank you for all of your help uh, to me these past few months through the college application process. It was truly invaluable. I hope you and your family enjoy the holiday season, okay? Uh, this is one of my students who's admitted to uh, Duke, one of my students who, who got admitted to UPenn. This is Ashley. I got in. Thank you so much for all of your help. And uh, this is Stanford. Uh, interesting note from her. She says, hi, Mr. Dixon. Thank you so much. Here's my note. I apologize for the delay. I'm excited to announce that I will be attending Stanford University next fall. I'm so grateful for Mr. Dixon's support and guidance of these past few months. His essay feedback and meetings helped me refine my personal statement and supplement shaping my application and helping me gain admission to Stanford, thank you so much. And I kind of go through, this is one of my students from uh, uh, NYU um, and uh, to, to let me know she got into NYU. This is a school that she really wanted to go to. The interesting story about Tia was a student who's very similar uh, to William and we built her profile around golf. She's a golfer. And uh, uh, we built it about her, around her thinking while on the golf course and her strong focus as it related to her interests. She wanted to apply to the Stern School of Business initially, and, I, and she's interested in economics, but she did not have the background for Stern. And so we said, look, we're gonna do the arts and sciences route. We're gonna apply early. 
and, uh, and, and that's what we did. And, uh, and, and she's very happy, very successful. This is another letter that I received from a mom. I'm not gonna go through and, and read that. If you want to, you can just take a screenshot and picture that and, uh, and you can read that later about what we did, you know, what I was able to do um, for uh, um, her son, okay. And uh, now what I wanna do is I just wanna kind of show you some of my results uh, from, from last year and so far, so far this year. Now my results and my team results uh, together. And uh, we had some pretty good results uh, for our students and uh, very, very pleased. I'm not gonna spend a time, this is pretty self-explanatory. So again, this is something that you all can take a picture of, take a screenshot of and be happy to talk about that. And this is evolving, this is uh, this, this year uh, right now. And uh, these are my results, uh, Princeton, Stanford, UPenn, Duke, John Hopkins, you can look. Of course, NYU is very popular. Okay, so it kind of sticks up there, but this is evolving. I have students that need to report into me all of their EA results uh, you know, so far. And then of course, we're gonna have regular decision results. So I think this year is gonna be an excellent, excellent year uh, for my students. So once again, folks, thank you so very, very much. I could talk to you guys for hours, uh, but I need to stop. Thank you so much. And I Thank really you. appreciate you indulging me uh, this evening. Thank you very much, uh, Sophia and everyone. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.